changing uh, retail landscape, not only in Malaysia but also China, Singapore and also USA. Uh, for a start, let's start off just to give you an overview about the retail growth for the past couple of years. Starting from 2016, the GST days, you can see the very sluggish growth of only 2%. And the last two, three previous years, you can see it's only plus minus 4%. And this year, we also expect about probably around 4% or so because uh, due to the lower turnout of the tourists. Uh. And you can see that Malaysia, uh, in totality, uh, retail constitute about 10% of the total GDP of Malaysia, while in Singapore is only about 1.5%. So actually, you can see uh, also that observe that it's a, it, it's a very big part of the economy. And as mentioned just now, uh, you know, by Intel, that uh, retail is a, the third largest uh, GDP contributor in ASEAN countries. And in Malaysia, I can see that we have a lot of dynamic uh, people in the sectors of retail. Our retail should grow by double digit. Uh, sadly, but it's only about 4%. And I was touching on how we can actually grow that. One of the biggest areas, of course, is tourism. Uh, which gives us an immediate impact. Uh, because Malaysia, you see, basically we only have about 32.5 million population, which is rather small. You can't uh, generate a lot of disposable uh, income and expenditure uh, to create more retail activities. So we need external factors like tourism, you know, my second home. And of course, even like uh, students uh, coming to study in Malaysia is another very important factor. You look at uh, Australia, in fact, all my children study in Melbourne. Look at the dynamics of the retail and the you know the, the tourism. Uh, it's all related one in one another. So these are areas that we should look at it. Now. Of course, not the illegal ones. Um, these are some of the factors uh, facing the challenges of retail. Um, perhaps you can have a quick glance of it. But in, as in any business, there's always challenges. Uh, at least would not deter uh, people going to retail. And of course, the cost of rising uh, uh, doing business is always there, especially with the malls. You know? Every three years, they increase the rental. You have to renegotiate, and you probably have to do renovation every six years. You know, this is another big uh, cost factor. And of course, uh, uh, labor in Malaysia is growingly is increasingly expensive, going up uh, because of the levies. And nowadays, you can't even deduct the levies from the workers. You have to pay for them. Uh, so these are these are other factors that uh, what you call it uh, challenges for retail. And let's look at the uh, Klang Valley. Basically, there are five first tier malls. I call them. You have from Surya Kelsey Pavilion, uh, Mid Valley, One U, Two, uh, Sunway. These are the five first tier uh, what you call it uh, malls. I call them. Uh, they are the biggest and the most. And some of them uh, we call them. Lifestyle or luxury brand uh, or branded uh, malls. Branded malls doesn't mean that, I mean, luxury malls doesn't mean that you have all the luxury goods. Uh, even like, for example, Pavilion is like a luxury mall, it's only about 20 30 percent uh, branded or in the highly in the luxury area. Is it? And of course, by 2020, they projected that we're going to have about 170 million square feet of letable space in Malaysia with about 700 malls. And up and coming now, you can see in Johor Bahru, we have so many others are coming up, like Sunway to Mega Mall, Ikano, and Country Garden. These are huge. And in Klang Valley itself, you can see TRX, you know, uh, about 2 million square feet. Two big pavilions at the Damansara, Bukit Jalil, and not forgetting KL118 is coming. There's also a big retail element there coming up, uh, should be ready in two years' time. So these are adding up to a lot of uh, pressure to the occupancy of the retail. Currently, it's only about 85 to 87 percent in Klang Valley. So, of course, uh, retail and malls and all and tourism basically are very symbiotic in nature. So, we need each other's support to actually drive this sector in a very fast manner. I think the one of, one of the areas shown was in Bangkok, is it? They are very successful retail in Bangkok due to one of the biggest reasons was uh, because of tourism. Uh, and let's touch a little bit on FMB, which is a very sexy uh, area where a lot of people like to go to FMB because uh, you know you feel very proud if I own that this restaurant, own that restaurant, you see, or own this concept, that concept. Uh, 
you, you look at uh, in Malaysia, you, those days we used to have only about 20% of F&B, that means restaurants, uh, food and beverage in the malls, but today it has grown to 30 to 40 percent. Uh, of course, these are new landscape which I'll be touching, especially in Singapore, will be one of the earliest, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, exchanges in the mall because of online business. Huh? So you can see in Europe, it's still very sluggish. For FMB, it's only about 10 to 15 percent. Perhaps the Masale don't eat as much as the Asians, or drink as much as the Asians. And Hong Kong, you're 23 percent, but uh, sadly now, it's falling very flat. Huh? All the retailers are crying there, have to pay big rentals and many have to close up. Huh? Uh, so these are very big challenges uh, in Hong Kong. And today, Singapore, Singapore being the first, uh, what you call it, in terms of online business, they're the number one in ASEAN countries. So that's why they will be the most affected by the online business. I can see that today they are putting more and more F&B into the malls to create more activities to attract and regenerate the malls. And if you look at the F&B business again, uh, uh, first year probably there will be 30% failure. Uh, we fail, and then the next three years, within the next three years, probably 60% or so will follow. So one of the areas that uh, to be assured, or at least you have higher chances of success, is to bring in franchise as a franchisee. You bring foreign brands in. Uh, like the bubble teas have been very successful. Some of it, like for example, Char Time, uh, the Ellie's and so many others. And of course for America, you have the big names like the TGI, you know, McDonald's, and KFC and all this. So these are some assured brands. Um, of course, there are new, always new players coming to the market. So it's up to you to source and whichever risk or level of risk you like to come in. And for your information for F&B, uh, first of all, you need to put a lot of upfront money. For example, three to four months of uh, when you rental deposit, uh, at the same time, you have to do a substantial uh, renovation and that will cost you easily, even a small like a barber tea, may cost you up to half a million. Uh, another restaurant, let's say a fine dining restaurant, may cost you easily a million dollars and above. So whatever cash you put in, there's always risk there. Huh? So if you make a good business, uh, is, I mean you feel very proud and you'll be very happy. Every month counting all the way, going to the banks, just to count the money. But if it's, because of the high rental and the low uh, sales, you're going to have a big problem. Then you, every month you'll be crying to the bank and not laughing to the bank. <laughs> so this one area uh, uh, is very lucrative as well, if you do it right, but uh, be aware. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned just now, for tourists uh, to come in, this will actually lead to a big boom in terms of uh, retail, especially on the malls. And today you can see some of the malls are empty because we are just depending too much on local uh, consumers you know, and buyers. And that is not healthy. And uh, besides that, you have to face the challenges of the online slot. Then. So uh, we definitely need the tourist dollars to come in. Huh? And uh, you can see in Malaysia, although we speak two thirds of the language of the world, we are, we are still very far behind in terms of tourism. Compared to even Thailand. You see, Thailand today, there are more than 10 million uh, China tourism, uh, and they spend tremendous money. Can you imagine places we can just bring in extra, just three million uh, tourists, just times one, uh, just one thousand uh, US dollars. You probably brought in about twelve billion straight away to the economy, and this is one sector I've been propagating very strongly to the government that we have to push very strongly and aggressively on uh, tourism to regenerate and reactivate the economy actually in the fastest uh, period of time you see looking at uh, you, if you were to travel to Thailand Bangkok today you can see the icon Siam the latest uh, shopping mall you can see they bring a lot of uh, new activities into the mall they bring the street activities uh, they bring the boat uh, activities and also the street activities into the shopping mall and these are some new uh, development that uh, makes the mall more exciting rather than a mundane mall, every time you walk in, you see all the top brands there, there's nothing else. Huh? So, and the, afterwards, I'll touch a little bit on Singapore, you can see Singapore have done a total regeneration of all their malls huh? with very exciting features and uh, activities. And, and of course, in future, most of the malls, I expect people will be using uh, AI, huh? like Intel is propagating. Huh? Uh, Intel probably will play a very big role in all these areas. Huh?
you look at the retail, those days we just use normal credit cards and cash. You know. Now, you look at China, they, they don't even carry much cash. You, know. you go to China, you become very poor. Like, we used to go to China and do shopping. We start taking all the things and then we ask, can we sign my card? Yes, when you bring out your visa and master card, they say, sorry, <laughs> this cannot be signed, not this card. <laughs> We have other cards, or the smartphone, you know, or the union card, is it? So we have to be careful that in China they're using not 90%, they're all using through smartphone, even the beggars, uh, whatever, uh, donations, you're making, you know, just go with smart card, smartphone, just scan it, and that's it, you know? And it's so easy. And there was once I run short of cash in, uh, to pay uh, the bill in, to pay an exhibitor in Shanghai. I just called my friend in his KL, he just transferred the money straight away from the smartphone to the other. Sell it to me, and then it, it's so easy. It's within a minute. You, you get it's, it's all done. It's all transacted, you know. And that's how it works in China. And looking at US today, there's actually USA is falling behind a lot on these uh, what you call it e payments. Today, less than fifty percent using smartphone, you know. And uh, in Malaysia, it's only about fifty percent or so. And very interestingly, you, uh, there's a story about uh, you know the American youth and the China youth. You, when you go back to Starbucks in US, the American you will be talking about, hey, Taro, when are we going to party? And which place are we going tonight? <laughs> you know, you go to China, the youth there will be talking, what business are we going to do? How are we going to make more money? So you can see the two sides of the divide. One side is more of fun, one side is more of business. So how can China not grow? See? That's why within the past 20, 30 years, China has grown up so big in terms of economy. Now people are hungry, they're hardworking, they're fast. You know? Uh, they're aggressive, very ambitious. So you can see two sides of the divide. Definitely China is going to win the economic war uh, very soon. And today China already the number one on drones and nanotechnology and many others. And even uh, this online e-healing business. And touch a bit on tourism now. Uh, as I mentioned this now. Uh, you see, by 2030, tourism will be the number one world GDP contributor. Uh, so you can see it's one of the fastest or fastest growing sector of any economies. Huh? And last year alone, there was about 6% growth to 1.4 billion people traveling around the world. Huh? And China contributed a very big uh, part of it. Okay, they spent easily 300 billion uh, USD huh? outside uh, China. Probably more because they put in buying a lot of properties. You go to Australia, you know, that's a joke. Uh, my children used to stay in uh, Melbourne. You know, in Melbourne or in Australia, they sell properties by auction. Here, auction means you are for sale. It's not for sale. In Melbourne, every property is sell by auction. You know? That means whoever bid the highest, you can say. So this Chinaman go there and buy this mansion for 20 million uh, Aussie. Of course, these people ask, how much loan are you taking? Are you taking on the, for the loans? And I said, no, I, I plot my bank. And that's it. <laughs> you see? I mean, they have the kind of money you see, to spend. And uh, that's why I said they probably spend more than the 300 million US. With a lot of other uh, money you can't see. Eh? And uh, very interestingly, you look at the most uh, visited cities of the world. So, uh, Bangkok seems to come up with number one. Uh, of course, many people say the tourists go there a lot for fun. But not just for fun. Today, uh, Thailand is the number one on health tourism. Eh? Although Malaysia is also coming up, we are the fastest growing. Last year, we are about 60 to 70% growth on health tourism. So, Malaysia is also tailing very closely to that. But, Sadly, we don't have enough tourists. We need to bring in more and more tourists. We have a lot of attractions, but not enough uh, tourists to come in. Uh, and you look at the, uh, what you call it? When you talk about tourism, they give you very immediate multiplier effect. And that's why it's very healthy for any economy to survive. You know? And looking at Europe itself, uh, last year they have about a million, uh, suddenly Italy have a million, but a million Chinese going to, to uh, Italy. And the, the Italians, uh, businessmen suddenly found that all their branded goods are all disappeared. <laughs> Those they cannot sell something all, you know. Same was in, happened in Japan many years ago. So the tourists, the, especially the Chinese tourists, are very strong, uh, very powerful spenders. And of course, uh, the Middle Eastern, but not so many. And India is coming up very fast. We also, like Malaysia, we should tap into the middle uh, group of uh, tourists from uh, India. And of course, Europe as well. Uh. And mentioned about uh, regeneration of malls, uh, retail. 
there's a lot of changes in uh, Singapore. Singapore being, as I mentioned, they've been the foremost in the on, online, uh, on the retail, especially on online. That's why they are the first casualty to, uh, I mean, to see all this uh, happening. Especially many stores have closed. Is it? Uh, so even some of my favorite brands like the Rao, GAP, Banana Republic, and furniture. Not straight. They have also a very strange name for the furniture group that they closed. I want to go home. The name is so it's very important. They have a nice name also. Or a name. I want to go home. Suddenly they have gone home. Is it? So they are no more. Last year, it's up to 3,000 or 3,000 stores, about 2,000 stores closed. And since 2017 in the USA, so very interestingly, because of online, by Amazon especially, about 21 major retailers have closed on, under the, uh, the farm back for bankruptcy. The latest being Forever 21. This is uh, one of the very top brands of the youth uh, in the, since the year uh, 2000. And it has filing for bankruptcy, and of course, there are shares and Toys as well, you know. So, for Singapore to survive now, most of the malls are regenerated. So, especially on FMB, you see, you go there, they are about 50% uh, now on FMB. You know, you go some of the malls, you can see that now they have more live seafood, they have uh, even cooking glass. And you can see when you go to Takashimaya, uh, Lululemon, another brand, you can see they also have yoga class, they have bowling, they have fighting zones, they have virtual reality for gamers. And WeChat actually got the biggest income from uh, games, you know, actually from WeChat phone. You know. They have more than 40% of the income. They found this niche and they have very big income from the, from the games. And uh, even Gucci, you can see today, Gucci, Gucci is such a big brand in the world. Last year, they were 26% growth. Why? They are changing to consumer needs. They are adapting, you see. They even, even personalize the bags and other uh, luxury items they have. And YSL is another one, also had 27.5% growth last year. And overall last year, uh, for luxury goods, they have about 10.7% growth in the world. That shows that the propensity to spend for the higher group of people is still always there. Isn't it? The rich are always getting richer, the rich are always able to buy whatever they want. So it's actually a constant uh, sort of uh, sectors. Uh, uh, of course, we always say that uh, make money from the rich is the best, uh, uh, and not the poor. <laughs> And in Dubai, the latest you can see also, uh, they have a new fashion store that opened uh, with uh, uh, interactive mirrors, they have all kinds of uh, dimensions so you can test your clothing and all this, your fashion, whatever you want, and with artificial intelligence. So these are a lot of things are happening in the retail. And in Singapore, Singapore being Kiangsu, you see, you see, you, you can if you go to the orchard stretch, uh, those days used to be very, very busy. Now it also have been a bit more subdued because uh, retail is dropping and also tourism is uh, probably less tourists are going there. So now the government is being very serious. They even appointed a uh, history uh, Australian company to do a very thorough study and just give a blueprint to make sure they rejuvenate and uh, upgrade this place uh, in the next coming uh, for the next 15 to 20 years to make sure Singapore stay relevant in terms of tourism and, and upgrade the retail. So these are very interesting things that's happening around the world, and uh, online and offline. Uh, some will ask, uh, will, "Can we just go online?" Or can we just go offline? But you can see the world uh, now changes in the landscape of retail. Is that you must always combine both of it, isn't to survive? And look at uh, Walmart being the largest uh, hypermarket in the world, uh, the top earners uh, those days was suffering a lot of sales uh, drop and then decline. So they went into online, you see, what the word uh, jet.com for a very huge sum of money. And interestingly, this guy, Mark Law, was also the founder of another online company that sold at Amazon many years ago for <laughs> only about a quarter of the price, you see. So this guy must be a genius. And today you can see uh, this uh, Walmart is coming back and is fighting very hard uh, the, uh, the online both online and offline. And you can see that uh, customers for both, if they use online and both uh, offline, they, are tend, they tend to be more loyal to their brands. So it's good to have both. So you have uh, offline, let's say doing online business today, it's good to have a physical stores or future physical stores to reinforce your brand as well. Yeah? And even Alibaba, uh, won't lose out. He bought, he bought over this uh, 
this, uh, what do you call it, uh, physical store, like bread and mortar, like in time, and even JD Telecom have their own physical stores. And even uh, and today, in China, uh, Alibaba and JD.com, they are so strong online, they control more than 82%. That's why even Amazon cannot compete and have to be exited from the market. There are no more in China today, Amazon online. Today. You can see the fierce uh, competition that's going on. Although there are not many, but the competition is rather fierce. And for the China groups to go to uh, US for payments and all this, you can see Alibaba have collaborated with First Data. They can't go in alone. You go in, you, you definitely going to fail. Uh, like Amazon, they just came in alone. They probably, they probably would have uh, succeeded if they say they collaborated with some China parties in China, is it? And look at WeChat also have uh, collaborated with Sitcom in the USA. And in Europe, Alibaba even went one step further and now collaborated with uh, many of the platform uh, with more than 5 million users now through all these uh, 200 lower merchants. And last month, I brought a group of my members, uh, uh, Blazer retailer members and the council. We went to Shanghai and interestingly, we also visited uh, Herma. Herma is actually a fresh hippo. A new concept started by Alibaba about 2-3 years ago. This is a, like a you know, supermarket, all with fresh seafood. Uh, but the store is nothing to shout about actually. It's basically like maybe a giant grocer or Asia, a, a village grocer. But the difference is that they can deliver to your home uh, within 3 km in 30 minutes. And every day they replenish the freshness of the goods. Huh? So let's say at the end of the day, if they still have left a lot of uh, balance of certain item, they have a data of let's say. Uh, Mr. So and so have a lot used to buy a lot of these items. They will sort of contact you, probably give you some discount, whatever, and then they try to clear up all the stocks for the next day. So these are very important and you can see very dynamic uh, ways of doing business. It's no more you go to the, the physical store, they're coming to your home. You see? So while you cook, you can still order extra items and then within 30 minutes they come to your house. And, and this is very interesting. We also visited JD.com. Uh, JD.com today is also a very big player after Alibaba. You go to their warehousing, it's so interesting. There's very few people working there. Uh, they all using robotics and AI recognition, uh, using QR codes and all this. So whatever, whatever the, the flow of the let's say delivery of the goods, they go by conveyor belt and then they, the QR code and using all these uh, whatever AIs and all these uh, they to try to attack, uh, I mean they detect uh, the robots and all this, they detect the code and they can go to various, various sectors, various, various de destinations. Yeah. And all all these are working over time. Yeah. And with robots around, you see, you see they don't have to sleep, they don't have to rest. That's why production can go up two to three times in any factories or any warehousing for using robots. And the best of all, quality control also <coughs> improved by easily 20%. And for this, uh, JD.com, they can deliver within 11 to 11. That means you order 11 o'clock in the morning, a shirt will get delivery by 11 in the evening latest. You order 11 in the evening, latest you get 11 in the morning, the latest. So these are interesting uh, progress happening in uh, China. And looking at the uh, online again, is so powerful. Look, uh, remember, if you remember the Alibaba, Alibaba 11, 11 uh, sale last year, one day itself, the sale was about 32 billion USD. One day, just a one day sale, can you imagine? The previous year is about 20% less. You know? One day, can you imagine? And because of that, even Thailand has started, a, they have announced a 50 billion uh, uh, startups for uh, what you call digital online to help those people who like to go into online business. And online business is one of the best areas to go in because, you see, it, it requires very little startup, uh, very little seed money, very little capital. So you can basically start small. You can start very small with one item, you know, you can start growing that. And many actually have succeeded. It takes time, but uh, you go to the right platform and the right products and right uh, promotion, you actually can succeed over the long term, you see. And in Malaysia, though we are still very small, about 5% using on online, but it's a double digit growth every year. So this is one sector we also must watch, you see. And uh, to protect their, uh, to protect their, what do you call it, uh, products in, let's say, in Malaysia or any other countries, and also to have more revenue for the country, uh, 
Uh, there are some of the countries you look at uh, Norway, New Zealand, Russia, they've put in imposed a tax of 15 to 25 percent. And this is uh, what's going on. And for Alibaba, Jack Ma has a very ambitious plan that he wants to deliver anything within China within 24 hours. And worldwide, maximum 72 hours. And this is actually a very big ambition. And Jack Ma is uh, going towards that. Uh, you can see even all over the what call logistic company called Sto. Uh, and this is to really keep developing the logistic part of it. Because you want to succeed in online business, Logistic is a very, very important, uh, in fact, probably the most important component to succeed. Otherwise, if it takes too long, nobody wants to buy your products. Eh? And as I mentioned about the automation and uh, you know, robotics, you can see the production can go up very easily, three times you know, in quality. And interestingly, today in China, so if you look at all the top R&D companies, they are basically all digital. Let's start off with, you can see Huawei has been uh, news lately and they are growing very independently daily. Probably very soon they don't need the US to supply any chips or any special items eh, or components. Of course, your China Telecom, then Alibaba, Tencent and JD.com. These are the, some of the top uh, companies, basically are digital, uh, they're going very heavily on R&D. And this will probably you know, conquer the world very soon. Eh? And uh, for doing business in these coming years, very important, we must always look at the millennials. This is actually the, probably the, the century of the millennials. You know? You see, uh, in the worldwide today, about 25% are millennials. But Malaysia, strangely, we have slightly more than 25%, we have about 29% you know, for millennials. So whatever business you do, it's good to look at this sector to put a bit more contribution into the uh, millennials. Okay? They are the one, the future consumers, they're going to buy your products. Huh? And this already started online. In fact, in Malaysia, probably 60-70% of the online uh, consumers are all millennials. Huh? And these are some of the common challenges for e-commerce. I'm sure you already uh, have some of this in mind. And uh, Intel also just now have uh, what you call it, review some of this. And, and you can see uh, this, uh, some of the uh, challenges faced by those who are going to e-commerce. Just take note of it, if you are really going to be zero. And there are also a lot of uh, trends uh, for the 2019. Uh, I think Huawei has been mentioning a lot of uh, 5G, very soon you have driverless car. You don't, you don't, need, you don't even need uh, any drivers. You know? We always have problems with drivers. Today he comes late, tomorrow he doesn't come, or he comes late, you know. So, and uh, even the use of chatbots, you can, can uh, reply you in simple questions or answers. And uh, even smartphone, they have augmented reality. Now you can buy your products through the phone. You can test, let's say, the color of the shirt or fashion, whatever you can use. Uh, they already have this uh, augmented reality. And virtual reality, they won't even start it in the cinemas now. Become so real when you watch shows, huh? it's like a real show. Is it? As if you are alive there. You know? So, these are things happening uh, in the uh, digital world. And of course, uh, we also have uh, these transformation trends in uh, 2019 for the digital. You can see now things are going omni channel, that means online, offline, and co cognitive computing that is uh, using AI, artificial intelligence, uh, facial recognition. And smart makers, they are also using a lot of uh, this uh, Bluetooth. Uh, through Bluetooth, they can do promotion for you, especially the uh, malls. Uh, they attract your promotions. They attract customers to your restaurant or to your shops. And cashless, cutlers uh, checkouts today. Even Malaysia, besides WeChat, Alibaba, Alipay, we have uh, so many now. We have Touch and Go, Grab, uh, even Fade, Boost, Boost Pay. All these are cashless. So eventually, you know, we have to engage with all this. So it's important that we have to seriously look at uh, these areas of uh, what you call it, that can contribute to economic and uh, business sector to ease uh, payment mode. People now is more convenient. That's why online is there. Uh, convenience is important. That's because time is money. Uh, people want to save time and maximize the time for the best productivity. So thank you. Uh, hopefully, Get some insights from this uh, weekend.